All right, let's get started. So, all right, let's get started now. So hopefully everybody has done with project one and has turned that in. And uh, there's another project out there ready for you. So this one will be quite a bit more substantial. So uh, if you procrastinated the last time and it worked out okay, uh, th that doesn't mean it's going to work out again. So I would encourage you to like, get looking, working on this very soon. Again, there's two parts for it. You have to make your own shell. And last time we talked a lot about uh, uh, different Linux system calls that will help you do this, such as fork, exec, and pipe, and so on. And so today I'm going to be showing you some stuff in the XV6 kernel that will help you with the other part, which is on, on scheduling. So another thing uh, that's different about this project the last time is that now you can have a partner. So if you have a friend in the class, feel free to work with them, or you can uh, email the class mailing list if you want to try to find, uh, connect with somebody else to work with. So before we look at the scheduling stuff, because you're going to be making a new scheduler in XV6, I just want to look over some code that was confusing <coughs> to a lot of people on project one. And in particular, well first, okay, let me uh, extract my source code here. So in, in particular, last time a lot of people were confused why you have to have uh, in your header file for user space, you have an arguments, you specify what the arguments are to your functions. So let's say uh, to your system call. So say for instance the kill, the kill system call is taking an integer, but then if you look over in the kernel code, you actually see that it's not taking anything. And uh, this threw a lot of people off. So uh, I think like you could, probably a lot of people figured it out with actually understanding why we have this difference here. So I'm just going to explain that now. So uh, basically, uh, when you're running in user space and one function calls another, uh, say A calls B, A is going to be pushing the arguments on the stack for B, and then B will be reading those off. So what you have to think about is what happens when we do a system call. In this case, A is still going to push the, the arguments on the stack, but now we're going to be switching to... Uh, kernel mode, and maybe we have a completely different address space then, but we're certainly going to have a different stack. We can't use the same stack that the user's program is using because maybe they filled it all up and there's no space for us, or uh, maybe somehow they are changing it while we're using it. So we have to have our own stack. So if we have a system call, we can't just look on our own stack to find the argument that was passed to us with the system call. So what we do, we need to figure out where the user's stack is and figure out where that argument is on that. And that's why these functions are using something like argument right here. So I'm just going to show you the definition of that quick. So basically, this proc here, that's the currently running process. And we have the trap frame. So these are the registers that were backed up when we switched to the kernel. And uh, from that, we get the stack pointer. And so this argument function is basically saying, Get the, get the argument off of the user space, space, space stack instead of ours. And that's why your system call will not take any arguments, and it has to use this to actually get parameters. So any questions on that before we move into the new stuff? All right, so what we're going to look at today is the mechanisms for switching between one process to another. And... That, that's good to just understand, but you actually won't have to understand a lot of it to be able to do the project. To be able to do the project, you're going to be more implementing the policy, and uh, so you won't have to touch a lot of the code I'm looking at today, but it's still good to understand. So the very first thing we can think about is what happens when this system, when this kernel boots up. And we're going to start in main, just like we would any normal program. And this is just the boot process here. So I hope you can fit all that on the screen. So there's lots of things that have to happen when it first boots up, and some of these we have already talked about. So for instance, we looked at some track vectors on the very first discussion, um, and this is just initial, initializing the console, and so forth. And also, um, so maybe you've noticed, but you actually have, uh, we're kind of running two CPUs on our, on our XV6 kernel. So this boot others is just saying boot up the other CPUs. And then we run this user init function, 
So when the so like think back when we were talking about fork, that's how we create a process, right? We just fork a previous process. Somehow you have to have the very first process that runs, and that's what this user init is just set, uh, setting up. And then uh, it's going to call into this scheduler function, which is going to run forever and just make a bunch of scheduling decisions and decide which processes to run. So I'm going to jump over, and uh, so you notice then that uh, this is the very last thing in here, right? So if this returned, then kind of our operating system is done running because there's no more code after this. So this scheduler function has to run forever. So I'm going to just, uh, so the very first thing is like you could read the comments and you see that this is a per CPU process scheduler. So there's both your CPUs are going to be running this code at the same time, their own version of it. And each CPU calls the scheduler after setting itself up. You just saw that. And again, it never returns. And then it loops doing these multiple things. First, it chooses a process to run. Then it switches to that process. And eventually that process is going to switch back to us. And then we can choose another process to run. So this, this part here of choosing a process to run, that's the policy here. And that's what you're going to be changing. And then the switching, that's the mechanism. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's just uh, look through this code. Have people seen this before? What, what, what is this doing right here? This for loop. It's just an infinite loop, right? They could have said wall true or something like that. So some, I, I heard one programmer say once that she thought this kind of loop looks like it's crying. Um, it is crying, yeah. I don't like that uh, syntax. So then, then it's acquiring some locks here. You don't have to worry too much about this. Um, later in the semester, you're going to know a lot about locks. And then we have another loop here. And uh, this might be a little weird for you if uh, uh, you haven't seen a for loop like this before. But to understand this, let's just see where this p table is defined. It's actually going to be at the top. Uh, we see this here. And what, what is this doing here? Um, this, this might be a little bit of a strange syntax, right? Because normally you see a structure and then a name and then you see these fields. Uh, well, what this is really doing um, is we're only creating, uh, we only have one of these structures, so it doesn't actually need a name. But this would basically be the same as if I said something like this. And then I said uh, uh, p table. So nothing, nothing too weird there. But we see that basically within this uh, p table we have an array of procs. And uh, you can find in the header files, but basically this is 64. Uh, so uh, you can only be having 64 processes on x86 at a time. Um, if, if you try to create more than that, it's just going to fail. Uh, so you have these 64 different slots, and maybe um, some of them are being used, maybe some are not. Uh, but each of them is just of the type struct proc. And, and you guys have, are fairly familiar with this structure, I think, but we're just going to do some review because there's more things we can talk about it for now. So we see this uh, struct proc, and you'll notice now, now that we've we talked about page tables uh, in Flask, so now hopefully more of this is trying to make sense. This is the page table for that particular process. That's going to find the address space for that process. Uh, we have the kernel stack, which we talked a little bit at the beginning of lecture today, why we need that. Uh, we have the process state, and I think now is the time to go over in these more detail. Uh, sleeping means you're just waiting for uh, some I.O. or something, so you couldn't run even if you wanted to. Runnable means that you're waiting for the CPU to schedule you. And then running means you actually are running. And then we also have unused. So in that big array, maybe uh, we would just put the state into unused if we um, don't have that process being used currently. Embryo means it's booting up. And then zombie is what happens when your process is, has died, it's finished but it hasn't been reaped yet. So the reason why we have to keep this is, if you remember last time we were looking at the wait system call, um, that call the parent uh, calls wait until the child finishes and then it can get a return code from the child. So we can't really just delete the child until the parent calls that. So between the time the child finishes and the parent collects it, it's just it's a zombie. So what else do we want to look at here? Um, so we looked at the state, um, trap names where we're going to have our our registers backed up. And then context uh, are a bunch of registers like the base pointer and instruction pointer and so on. And that kind of defines where we're currently running in the code and what our stack looks like. 
So if you see this comment here, it says that switch <coughs> uh, will take us to this context. So basically there's a switch function, which we're going to look at later, that makes us start running this process. So let's go back now uh, to proc.c, um, kind of unwind here a bit. So we were looking at, we have this array of these things, and we were looking at that because we wanted to see uh, ptable.proc, um, which is, which was down here. <clears throat> so basically, our initialization of our for loop, we're setting it up to point to the first element of that proc array. And then this here is the address. So there's only 64 things in here. And so since it's saying, give me the 64th element, there is no 64th element. So this is like the address right after uh, the end of the array. So we only want to run while we're pointing to less than that. And then let me see if I can fit all of this on the screen. Uh, Basically, so we had the infinite loop, so basically it, it goes through this loop over and over again. It just keeps cycling over all the processes. So let's, let's just go through all the code in here a uh, line at a time. So the first thing we do is we say if, uh, if the state is not runnable, we're going to pass over it, because basically what this loop is doing is it's looking for processes to run, and it's only going to consider ones that um, are eligible. So here, we've, if we get to this point, we've actually found a process that we could run, and then we have this switch UVM. And let me jump over and show you where this is. Uh, let me check in my notes so I don't have to grab to find out where the file is. Okay, and this is doing a bunch of things here. But the, uh, the more, most important structure what it's doing is it's doing this LCR3, and it's passing in the page table to that. And I mentioned it briefly in class yesterday, but the LC3 register tells the CPU where your page table is. So basically, uh, we have the process, and we're, we're referring to the page table for it, and we're telling the CPU, use the page table for this process now. Okay? So we do that, and then we mark it as running. So now we've switched, so this is part of our context switch. We've switched over our virtual address space. And the next thing it's doing here, uh, this switch function, what it's trying to do is it's going to, um, it's going to back up the current registers. So what are the current registers? The instruction uh, pointer, for example, will actually be pointing to this line of code. And it's trying to back up that and all the other registers in here, in this structure. And then it's trying to restore the registers from here. So by restoring, for instance, the instruction pointer, we're effectively jumping to another line of code. So this is pretty weird, uh, because if you were just reading this and you kind of know C, but you don't know a lot about operating systems, you'd think it would execute this and then execute this right after that, but that's not the case. As soon as we restore the instruction pointer and other registers, now we're running at a different place in code. So let me just show you how this switch works. So you see that this is a .s file, so this is assembly code instead of C. And it does some things here, but the comments here are pretty good. We don't have to look at all this uh, assembly in detail. First, it's saving, um, saving some registers for the current one. And then it's switching which stack we're on. And then it's popping some things off. And then I told you uh, it would be jumping to another place, right? So, but uh, you don't see any jump instructions here. So how is it jumping to another location in the code? What's that? What? Um, yeah, so basically uh, this return is going to be popping. So when you call a function, you push the return value, your return address, onto the stack so that when that function finishes running, it knows where to jump back. And that's what return does. It's popping that off and then jumping back. So likewise, when somebody called in to switch before, they push their address on their stack. So then when we kind of switch back to their stack later and we do a return, will return as if we never stopped running them, and we can provide this nice illusion. Okay, so we do that, and now eventually we come here, and this means that somebody must have jumped back to us, right? And so because we switched, because we switched the address space here, now we have to switch it back. So this is the KVM, that's like the kernel, kernel address space, okay? So does that make sense so far? So you should understand it from that side. So this is kind of how we're switching to another process. 
um, from the scheduler to a process. So the next we're going to look at how we switch to from a process back to the scheduler. So any questions before we look at that? Yeah. So what you're, you're saying, how do we get back here? So basically, so when we call this switch, we're going to the other process. And eventually that process is also going to call switch and we're going to come back here. So let me, let me actually go back to the process code uh, or the process structure code. So you see that there's actually some comments here. It's saying switch, switch here to run the process. So that's what we did. And then also for each CPU, this is also another context, right? This is just, uh, uh, we call this context scheduler, but it's the same type as we have down here where it's just, it's just a struct context. And this one says, uh, this one also says switch here to enter the scheduler, right? So we call switch to move away and then the other one is going to call it to come back. Other questions? Let me pull back up the other code so you can look at it and see if this makes sense so far. Okay, so now we can look at this from the other angle. So this is how we're switching from our scheduler to running another process. And so we aren't going to be, uh, we're, we don't want to build a cooperative scheduler, right? So we don't want to uh, rely on the processes calling yield for us. So we have to be non-cooperative and we have to just do what we want. So how, how do we do that? Do people remember? What's that? Yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a timer interrupt, and that's going to go off. And whenever, whenever that interrupts the process, then the operating system takes control, and it can do whatever it wants. So we've looked at some of this code before. Um, this trap function in trap.c. And in particular, before we were looking at the system call interrupt. And if you go down here, you see there's a lot of other things. We have a timer here. Um, we have a keyboard, some other devices, and so forth. And if we go all the way down to this function... We say that if there's an interrupt and the process is running, and also it's this timer interrupt, then we call this yield function. So, so there's still a yield, but we're calling it from within the operating system on behalf of the process. So we're, the process doesn't have any say in whether or not this gets called. So let me show you where this is. So this is back under uh, proc.c, I think. So this is just calling, it's taking some locks and calling sketch. Well, first, first this changes the process state to runnable. What was it before that? Running. running, yeah. The process was running, it got interrupted. Now we're saying you're no longer running, you're just runnable. Um, and, this, and this is calling this sketch function. So this is different than the scheduler, um, uh, which was the other function we had been looking at. Where is this? Okay. So this is calling this other short little function. And there's a lot of code here. What, what, what do panics do? Have people seen this before? This is basically the kernel equivalent of an assert in your user space program. So this is just saying that if you hit this, um, the kernel should just kind of like dump out a message and stop running. So this is just a lot of error checking code. So the real, the real guts of this is just down here. And we see that this is doing another switch, just like somebody asked about, how, how do we ever get back? And this time, we're saving our register, say our instruction pointer, into the context for this process. And now we're switching back to the context for the CPU. So that's going to take us back down to where we were before. Um, let me get down there. So that gets us back here now. And so this returns from here. And then it's as if we kept running, right? So we keep looping over these things, and uh, uh, like we'll switch, we'll say like process A, um, and then scheduler, process B, scheduler, process A, uh, back and forth. Um, let me actually uh, kind of show this in some notes here to make this more clear. So we have, we have uh, user mode, and also we have a kernel mode. And kind of first, A might be running in user mode, and then it gets interrupted either from a system call or from an interrupt. So then A, even though we're running the operating system code, we can kind of think of the operating system as acting on behalf of that process. 
So that's why we have this global process variable. Um, it's just the process we're currently acting for. And then we do that SWTH, the switch, and then uh, we're running the scheduler. And then the scheduler does another switch and we're running B. And then we're going to return from B's interrupt before. Maybe B did a system call or did a timer interrupt. And then we're back there again. And then as time goes on, uh, B is going to get interrupted. We're going to come back here. And then the scheduler could run again. And then, uh, so we're going to go back to A, and then we can go back to A. So from, from the user's uh, perspective, so we just have this process A, it looks like it either did a system call or got interrupted, and then it looks like it just took a long time to run. But while it was taking that long time to run, we were doing this stuff in the middle. So does that make sense? Any questions so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when the scheduler runs, yeah, that process, uh, that global process thing should be, uh, should be like null. It shouldn't be set to anything. So maybe, maybe it would make more sense if I actually look, go back to some, if I can find it. There's a, there's a pretty good comment in here explaining uh, the page tables. So. This is kind of the memory layout in, in here. And, and we don't have to read through all this comment, but it's basically saying there's one page table per process plus one that is used when the CPU is not running any process. And then it's also saying that the user process uses the same page table as the kernel, uh, but there are some protection bits that, that are different. So basically think like you're A, you're running in user space and you have a given, uh, you have a given page table. But the permissions on most of those addresses say that you can't read or write to this because that's like kernel memory. And then when you switch to the kernel, and you're, so you're kind of in the kernel mode, but you're acting on behalf of A, you have the exact same page table, but now you have permissions to access any of those things because you have to, right? You have to access your own kernel memory. But then, so we switch from being in the kernel acting on behalf of A to the scheduler, and now we're not acting on the behalf of anybody, right? So then that's why we have a separate separate page table here and there's no global, global process. Other questions? All right, so let me see what I have here next on, on my notes. So let's, uh, let's like trace through this a bit more. We've just been reading code but we haven't been running anything and I think it might be more clear if we um, see how this is going on. So let me exit this. So we, we ran uh, Kimu with debug mode in the first lecture, but I think I, I went kind of fast and people have been asking questions, so I'm going to run it again. Uh, so if we, if we just want to run um, Kimu with debug mode, I think it's something like, is it this? Yeah, just make GDB. So that, oops, I am, did not SSH with dash X. Let me switch to my other, other window. I must have not done that. I needed. Let me just SSH again. Oh, I have I have the X there. I wonder why it's not doing that. Okay, there we're going. So basically, uh, this looks like it's starting. And basically, when we ran with Kimu uh, GDB, it looks like the operating system just hang while, hung while it was booting up. So then if we want to actually um, run GDB on it, we have to get in a separate terminal window. And I have to make sure I'm in the same, same directory where my code is. And then what do these instructions say? They just say run GDB from another terminal. So we're going to do that. And the reason why it has to be in the same um, directory is that there's this uh, there's this init file here, and that's what GDB is going to look at. So I'm going to run GDB, and oh, it, it fails. And that's because GDB has these uh, security permissions in it. Um, you can set GDB up, up to do a lot of crazy stuff, so I think they're worried that you're going to load it um, with some bad settings. Just, just for an example, so we were working on 
a research project once where we wanted to kind of reverse engineer iTunes and understand uh, what system calls it was making. And, but they don't want you to uh, reverse engineer iTunes because they're worried you're going to steal music or somehow do something evil with it. So what we did, though, is we figured out that iTunes uh, was just calling the system call to disable tracing. So all we did is we kind of interposed on that with GDB, and we said every time uh, iTunes calls this thing, just fail. And guess what? That like worked then, and then we could trace it and do whatever we wanted and study it. Um, so that like GDB is pretty powerful if you like really understand um, all all its features. So that's why it's a security feature. Um, but but this is a nice message here. It's telling us exactly how to get around the security. We have to copy this this line here. And let me kill this. And this is saying set this in, uh, in this file here. So this .gdb init. So I'm going to do that and then try running it again. Okay, and now this worked. And we see a lot of output here. We see that um, it's kind of understanding where all the kernel memory is. So this is a good sign. It knows where the code is and so forth. And let me get yet another window here so I, we can go back to the code. So I'm just trying to show you how to set some breakpoints and step through things. Uh, let me hop back. Sorry, the latency is bad here. I'm typing, but it's not doing anything. There we go. Uh, discussion xv6. And I'm going to go back to the kernel code. And where do we call... Okay, so here, here's where we were switching before. So you see that this is line 277. I just want to uh, do a break right on this point, and then I can see when we're doing a process switch, uh, which one we're running. So I can say set a breakpoint. Let me raise this just so people can see. And I can say proxy, and then I can say after that which line I want. And I do that. Now I have a breakpoint set. And now if I run a command like continue or just C for short, then uh, it's going to run again. And we see then that it started running, but then Right away, it, it jumped back here, right? So kind of it's, we hit that breakpoint, so uh, the, the uh, kernel stopped running, and now, now we can do some debugging. So for instance, we can just start printing off uh, data structures. So for example, if I print off P, that was just the process we were about to run, the struct proc, and that's the address of it. But I could also print something like its name, and I see that this is a NIT code that's about to run. So I can continue again. And it's trying to keep jumping back here, right? Because every, uh, every timer tick, it, it hops back here. So I'm going to get rid of this now. Oh, I need to clear. Uh, so that's going to delete the breakpoint. And now when I continue, it can actually finish booting up, uh, booting up uh, the kernel and runs for, for a while. Um, so now that it's been running for a while, let's say I want to actually go back and set a breakpoint again while it's running. So I have to go back to GDB. And if I hit Control C, It'll just stop wherever it currently is, and I can set another breakpoint again. So I'm going to set it back uh, where it was before. So now I'm just saying B is an abbreviation, 277. I should uh, run this locally because this is... The latency is really bad on the SSH section, session right now. Okay, so we set the breakpoint, and we're going to continue. Okay, and let me hop back to the kernel. And as soon as I, so as soon as I start running something, it like hops back here. And now if I run, uh, if I print out the name again, I can see that sh, the shell is running. So this, like you could use this to step through your programs and debug. Um, like I, th I think it's useful to know the basics of GDB, but like personally, like 90% like of my bugging, I'm just like printing things out because I think it's a lot faster. And also, like, if there's multiple things running, you can kind of see how things interleave. Um, so there, there are some bugs that they only show up when you're not using GDB. So I'm going to exit uh, GDB now, and actually we're going to print some stuff out. Uh, and what was this one? Okay. 
And so now I'm going to go back to this prop. And I'm actually going to print out uh, a message this time instead of using GDB. So let me hop to scheduler. And right before it runs now, I'm just going to print off, say, the process name and also the PID. All right, and now let me run make Kimu again. Oh, I messed up my, I don't know what's wrong with this X11, why it's so flaky. Um, but let me, oh, maybe because I didn't use it this time. So let me hop back in here and then run this program. All right, so now we see all of this uh, messages out. So you see this is a lot faster than when we're using GDB. And let's just read through here because there's a few interesting things going on. So you see when it first starts, we have this init code, and that's PID1, and that runs a number of times. And then you see at some point, it, it probably does an exec or just changes its name because it switches from init code to just a net. That's still process ID1. And now, now this is strange, right? We see that an init with PID2 and an init with PID1. What's happening here? What's that? Yeah, exactly. So we forked the process, and now we have two processes with different process IDs, but the same name. So it runs uh, process ID2 for a long time. And now, now we see another th strange thing. It's uh, uh, with, uh, this is SSH and PID2. So he had said that before when we saw um, kind of this behavior, that was good old fork. So this would be good old what? Exact. So this is this is good old exact, right? So we were running um, the net program, and then all of a sudden that changes into uh, to the shell, right? And I could run other programs. So I'm going to run ls, and I have some garbage here, uh, but this this is the same thing, right? So uh, the shell was PID2. The shell forked itself. You just fork yourself if you want to uh, create a child, and uh, then um, after a while it does exact, and then it becomes ls. Okay, so any questions before we run another little program in here? Is everything making sense? All right, so let me hop out of here. And uh, I'm just gonna run a little program now so we can kind of see some more details of what's going on inside the scheduler. So actually, I'm gonna just go under user and I'm gonna copy the tester program to, I'll call this uh, spinner.c, and I'm going to make change my make file before I forget. And basically what I want to do here is I'm just going to make a program that runs for a long time, so that as I'm running this for a long time, we can see how it's switching back and forth between different processes. Uh, so, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have an int i and x, and I'm just going to say for i equals 0, and I'm going to run this based on whatever I take from the, uh, from the command line. All right, so it just does a little bit of work there. It um, doesn't really print anything out. And where am I? What's that? Oh, did I miss one? Oh, I see. I have a comma there. Good catch. Um, okay, so let me run this now. So this starts up. Okay, so this was all what we saw before. And I'm going to run two versions of this. So I'll say, um, how many is that? Is that 10 million? Yeah, that's 10 million, so I'll do that. And then, I mean, each shell is a little bit different. 
Uh, but on this shell, the way you run two programs at the same time is with this ampersand semicolon. And I'm going to run another version of tester, just like that. Let's see what this does. Um, so this runs for a while. And why, why did it run so short? This is a bad demo. Um, maybe it's just being slow again. Uh, I don't know why this is so slow. It worked when I wasn't doing it over SSH. Let me let me kill this and start over again. Oh, here here this is better. So you can kind of see that it's switching back between why is it having so many process IDs? Oh. Let me try that again. Wow, this is drawing really, really slow now. <laughs> All right, so what did I have before? I'll just try a million this time. Hmm. I guess uh, this is a good demo to try at home because it was working earlier, but I'm thinking maybe it's just that it's slow over the SSH session or maybe it's X11. Um, but basically what you should see is that it's just like alternating back and forth between the two processes each time. Um, so let me, let me hop back to the code and I'm just going to show you a few more uh, brief things before we wrap up here. Uh, so uh, based on what you see here, what, what algorithm is this currently, or what policy does this currently use for choosing processes? of the scheduling um, algorithms we've talked about in class. Yeah, this is round robin, right? It just keeps cycling through all of them. So uh, for you to change this, basically what you're going to be doing is you're still going to have to use this kind of code where you use, um, where you decide, uh, or where you actually like have the mechanism for swapping. But instead of just like looping over all of them, you're going to have to look through the processes in a different way and pick out a P um, that meets the meets the goals of what um, of how we define uh, the scheduler. So you have to look at that and see how we define the reserved and spot instances and how you do lottery between those. Um, so that's all I have for today. So any questions before we wrap up? Yeah. What's that? Right, yeah, so you have to, so right, if, if we just pick one after the other, then it's round robin, right? Yeah. But you could imagine of all these process structs, like let's say I was just doing lottery, I could add a field to each process struct that says how many tickets it has, and then I could know how many tickets there are total, and I could choose a random number, and then, uh, then I could loop over them and basically do the lottery algorithm, right? And then instead of just like choosing them in order, I could choose them by lottery or what else, whatever other policy. Other questions? All right, well, that's it, and then. So hopefully you can get an early start on this project and uh, be sure to ask lots of questions. And All right, 